there's potential nation collapse in China. They don't necessarily have nuclear weapons, but North Korea does. Oh, you they, have well, nuclear. the Chinese have nukes. <laughs> okay. I mean, it sounds like there's a terrible potential for some sort of nuclear conflict. You understand why the Biden administration is factor acting missile defense now? There's not a lot that we can do here. Uh, we can't stop in Ukraine because we just face a bigger war a few months later. North Korea is a bit of a black box itself. And so we were always going to need some sort of missile defense there. And the Chinese system has become a question mark. And, you know, barring preemptively carpet nuking these places, which I am not recommending, your only option is to make sure that if something does get flung, you're in a position to intercept it. Missile defense. Do we see other nations run toward nuclear armaments now that if they also come to these same conclusions? That, that's one of the risks that the Biden administration is mis making by going to Israel. If it becomes obvious that the United States is going to pick favorites but not put boots on the ground and is not interested in a broader regional strategic picture, we just pick friends and go front it. Then anyone who is not one of those friends, whether they're friends or foes, good or bad countries, nukes are really the only option that they can really have. So I'm not so much worried about nukes in Iran. To be perfectly blunt, this technology is nearly a century old, and if Iran was capable of doing it, they would have done it already. I'm worried about Poland. I'm worried about Sweden. I'm worried about South Korea and Taiwan and Japan. I'm worried about Saudi Arabia. Countries that have the technical or financial means to either build one themselves or go out and buy one. And if they think the United States really isn't concerned with their security, and for the most part, we are not, then they're going to have to do something themselves. And that's a very different world. And that's where we'll be within 10 years. So what changes that scenario? Because that's a very dark mm -hmm. road we just described. You just it would described. Take a, it would take a really big if. So the world that we are just now leaving, the globalized system, we created that at the end of World War II uh, in order to combat the Cold War. We basically created this system that provided so many huge economic benefits that everyone wanted to join. We would have to do something on that scale again. And I don't think we can do that without a significant change in the way Americans view everything. Coming out of World War II, we understood the cost of global instability in our bones. And so there was a tolerance for international involvement. We didn't have that after World War I. We had to lose a half a million soldiers to be sufficiently shocked into involving ourselves. And so we're at this moment of political transition in the United States. Maybe the next transition is going to be more internationally minded, but it's hard to see the logic for it. The North American economy is doing very well. In the transition we're going to see over the next 10 years, it's probably going to double the size of the industrial plant. I mean, that's that's a huge growth story, but it doesn't involve the Eastern Hemisphere. So it's difficult to, for me to see people on the left or the right embracing the sort of commitment that would be necessary to hold history at bay everywhere else. And then, of course, if we do decide we want to do that, the question is whether we can. You know, this this isn't 1970. We're not the only country with a Navy anymore. Right, which begs the question, if, if the U.S. turns inward, is there anyone else that can fill that role as we had Andrew asking about, you know, peacemakers, you know, yeah. uh, the, the uh, any country in a position to be able to step into that and somehow glue things back together and and, or at least stop an acceleration toward it, some kind of nuclear conflict. Yeah, there's only two countries in the world that have the capacity of doing that today on a regional basis. So France could do it in far Western Europe. Uh, Turkey could do it in Southeastern Europe and the upper parts of the Middle East. And they could have spheres of influence that have their own rules and their own security system. That could work for them. But that's it. Uh, the Japanese found a way to get along with the Trump administration and the Biden administration. The Japanese are the only people who figured out how to work with both sides of the American political aisle. So what could have been an independent sphere is now part of ours. And obviously, we're going to look out for the Western Hemisphere ourselves. And that's it. Uh, keep in mind that our military, in terms of the firepower it can throw, is several times more powerful than the combined navies of everyone else. And the second most powerful Navy in the world is Japan. And now they're on board. And the third most powerful is Britain. And if they can ever figure out Brexit, they'll probably be on board too. No one else can try.